So good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us on this first of what's hopefully going to be a string of beautiful days in Hanover. Um, my name is Jenna Musco and I work as a program manager in the Dartmouth Sustainability Office. Um, and I'm excited to be here today co-sponsoring this talk. Our office is excited to be here co-sponsoring this talk with the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and the Social Sciences. And I'm going to be introducing our speaker for the afternoon, Sonia Faruqi. Um, Sonia graduated from Dartmouth College in 2007 and is the author of the book Project Animal Farm, An Accidental Journey into the Secret World of Farming and the Truth About Our Food. Sounds like quite the journey. <laughs> the book traces her path from a successful Wall Street career to investigate animal farms around the world toward the aim of benefiting, an benefiting animals, human health, and the environment. Um, Project Animal Farm has drawn enthusiastic reader support and media coverage. Many of you have probably heard of it. Um, and the book has been listed for several literary prizes, including the Chautauqua Prize. Um, it's also being translated for international release, which is cool. Um, the book is available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook, and we're going to be selling it after the talk, courtesy, thanks to the Norwich Bookstore, and Sonia has agreed to sign copies as well. So if you want a copy after this talk, head on out there. Um, Sonia is a frequent TV and radio guest, and her work has been covered in dozens of media publications, including Salon, Vice, Forbes, Toronto Star, and the Boston Globe. Um, a Metro columnist wrote about Project Animal Farm. The book is like sitting down for a cup of tea with a friend, only to be swallowed into a long story filled with quirky characters and random encounters, an escapade through farms and the people who work them. So we're going to let Sonia tell us a little bit more about that escapade today. Um, she's also going to touch on the role of international public policy in her travels um, and about how federal and state laws in the US, Canada, and Europe um, play a role in animal welfare. So with that, Sonia. Thank you, Jenna. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's so exciting to be here. I graduated in 2007. Um, was that nine years ago? Yes. I'm 30 today, much older, a little wiser than I was when I was here. Um, but I loved everything about Dartmouth. <coughs> I came here as an international student. I was born in Pakistan, grew up in Dubai. Um, and coming here was the first time when I joined as a freshman. That was my first time visiting as well. And I loved it from the moment before I got off the Dartmouth coach. Um, from the little buildings to the charming town to the people themselves. As soon as I have an identical twin sister who also went to school here, and we created a lot of confusion. Um, and some people like Professor Parsa, who's here, recognized us and knew the difference between us, and so did some others. Um, but from the moment we got off the Dartmouth coach, people were willing to help us find our way and. Uh, help us with our huge suitcases of random stuff. Um, so it's been really wonderful for me. Dartmouth's played a huge role in my formation as a person um, and as a writer as well. And I'm very, very excited to be back here as a speaker. Um, OK, so who went on their DOC trip, the Dartmouth Outdoor Club trip? OK, how was it? Good? Yeah. I hated my DOC trip, <laughs> just to let you know. Um, I had never done anything outdoorsy before, and I was all about um, like eating chocolates and um, wearing heels and makeup and those kinds of things. <laughs> um, and then being in the wilderness or in the mountains was, for me, um, very much of a rugged experience, a little too rugged for me. So I hated it. I said, I'm never going outdoors again. I'm never doing anything like this ever again. Um, but then I wrote this book, which really was, it wasn't in the mountains, but it involved a lot of um, hitchhiking, a lot of traveling, living with all kinds of people, uh, getting really dirty. And um, it was very interesting. So I changed very much from the time I started um, to the time I am right now. And so let me take you with me on my journey. And I think my clicker is here. OK. Oh. 
this is what we're going to cover. I tend to talk a lot. Um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and let me know. And they'll also, I'll also ask you at certain times if you have any questions. Um, hmm. So in Dartmouth, I studied economics modified with public policy. That was my major, and I did a minor in government. I'm, I liked everything. I've always been interested in everything, so choosing a major was really difficult for me and a minor. Um, I was interested in public policy and government because uh, at that time I was uh, sort of interested in working at the UN um, and I thought if I study economics, policy and government that might get me in the door um, or at least have a conversation. But by the time I came close to graduation, a lot of my classmates were going to Wall Street. And I don't know, I think things have changed now, but in 2007, before the crisis, it was either investment banking or consulting. And I sort of fell into that as well, and I um, went to Wall Street. This is a, I was trying to find funny comics, um, and there's so many, but this is, this is one of them. So, <clears throat> I liked Wall Street. It was pretty good. There were, it was long hours, about 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. often. But it was a good pay. It was um, a job I thought was interesting enough. Um, despite the hours, it was sort of mindless. So I was working a lot, but it wasn't like I was uh, contributing to anything positive in the world. It was quite, um, I was in mergers and acquisitions, working on deals, buying and selling different kinds of companies, or helping with the buying and selling. Um, but it wasn't, I guess, fulfilling in a very personal way. I got laid off because of the recession, hundreds of thousands of layoffs in Wall Street. I ended up moving to Toronto because my family was moving there. And at that stage, I mean, I'd worked so hard for two years and I was kind of sick of it. I wanted to do my own thing, so I was reading a lot of books and I was thinking about what I really wanted in life, um, or what I was really interested in, at least. One of the topics I realized I was interested in and becoming more interested in was food, especially farm animals and how they're treated and what that means for us and for the planet as a whole. Um, so I found myself volunteering at a dairy farm, an organic dairy farm. Um, and I love the Dartmouth organic farm here. I was in touch with Scott when I was a student. Uh, and he was great. He was wonderful. So um, there are good organic farms and there are others that are not as good um, because there are some loopholes in organic. So I got to this um, farm and I was, as a volunteer, it was run by a middle-aged um, Dutch farming couple. Um, and from the beginning, it was really not what I'd expected. Having grown up in cities, I didn't know what to expect. But what I thought in the back of my mind was, especially in organic, it's going to be a really happy farm and uh, very fun and playful and at least outdoors. Um, so I get there and I'm having dinner with the farm family and uh, the wife whom I call Irene, I've changed names in the book to protect privacy, uh, she says I don't like animals at all and um, she's, they've been trying to sell the farm for a while. Um, she gives her husband a deadline every two years he says I'll sell the farm by my next birthday and the birthday comes and goes but it's still not sold. Um, so she tells me right after dinner, he said he'd sell it by the time he was 51, then 53, then 55, then 57, and we're still here, and his birthday's <coughs> coming up this week. Now what do we do? So um, she was very unhappy with it, and it was a very tense time for me to be there, and I was sort of caught up in this um, domestic dispute, to say. <laughs> So um, the next morning I wake up and I look out the window and because it's an organic farm I expect to see like some cows outside or uh, some sign of some animal outside, but there's nothing. Um, so it turns out the cows are kept in a cow shed. They're indoors for two thirds of the year, um, chained to stalls. And the remainder of the year, the one third of the year, they are outdoors. 
but even two thirds of the year chained to stalls is to my mind a lot, especially for organic and especially for animals like cows. Um, so does anyone know how much a cow weighs? You can just guess. Uh, and it could be higher too. It's about 1,300 pounds on average. So cows are, my point is cows are very large animals, uh, dairy cow. Um, but the stalls are about, so a cow is about that wide and a stall is about that wide. It's a very narrow stall. They can just lie down and stand up and that's pretty much it um, for two out of three days of the year. Which was very much of a shock for me. Um, and cows are very gentle animals. Um, I'd never interacted with them before, but they, they're very social, so they have good social memories of each other and also of people. Um, so on my first day in, they, were, they all stood up and they looked at me in a very hostile way. <laughs> and um, they were very cautious. It's like a stranger walking in. But as I came in the next several days, Day after day, they started to be very comfortable with me. They wouldn't pay much attention to me, and I could pat their head, and they were totally fine with that. Um, so they do have a memory of people, and they do, they definitely have a memory of each other because they're herd animals, um, but also of people, and they are intelligent in their own way. Um, and they're meant to graze. Uh, cows are meant to be outdoors, and even in cold temperatures, the dairy cows are usually just fine. So um, this was what was going on. At the same time, the farmer, whom I call Michael, his birthday party was coming up. Um, and his daughter arranged a surprise for him at her house. And she asked her mom, can you bring him to my house for the surprise? And her mom said, no way. Am I doing that? Because he still hasn't sold the farm. I'm not getting involved here. So his daughter, who was very nice and kind, asked me if I could bring her dad to um, the party. And I did. And it was really, uh, that night sort of changed my life. Um, because I met someone there who played a very crucial role in Project Animal Farm and in my own learning in life. Um, so it was about, there were only about five or six people there. Um, one of them was called Brick Roberts. He was 54 years old, this really bushy beard, bright red face, bloodshot eyes, and his uh, character was um, the most eccentric person I've ever met. Uh, he smoked 50 cigarettes a day, drank 10 cups of coffee every day, um, also drank a lot of alcohol, uh, um, and everything he said was sort of offensive to someone in some way. <laughs> But he was so warm and we could talk for hours. It was sort of like opposites attract in a way. Um, so he said, I, I have some hens, that's my job. Um, and I, so I was asking him just general questions like, oh, how many hens do you have? What do you do, et cetera? And he was being very vague. Like he wouldn't really tell me anything else. Um, so that aroused my curiosity. I, didn't know what the issue was or why he was being so vague. Um, so I ended up going to his office to have a chat. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next one. Okay, so I'm farmer Brick Roberts, yes. I ended up going to his farm to have a chat. Um, and we're sitting there, he's sitting with his feet on his desk, cup of coffee in one hand, cigarette in the other. Um, the usual sort of position, and um, we're talking about everything, but he keeps changing the topic away from animals. So even though he's a fourth generation farmer, and this is what his family's been doing for a very long time. So I eventually ask him for a tour of his farm, and he says, fine. Then he takes his feet off the desk, we get into his truck, and he drives me all the way around his property, which is about a thousand acres. Now, to me at the time, this was mind boggling that we drive around the whole thing and there's not a single hen or any animal or any sign of them anywhere. Um, so we get back to his office, back 
at the desk. Um, I'm looking at the soles of his boots, and I'm thinking, what is going on here? I don't understand what just happened. So eventually he says, fine, I'll show you my hands. And then, so his office is in like the, it's sort of like a junkyard, tiny storage closet slash office space. <laughs> um, and it's a part of a huge warehouse. It's a rectangular warehouse. And he opens a door behind his office and turns out the hands are right there. We'd been in the egg farm the whole time. I just had no idea because to me, the idea that hens are in this huge warehouse, it was just not something I had conceived of. So we go inside and this, so these are illustrations I've used in the book. I took photos and converted the photos into illustrations directly using a program. Um, but the, it's an exact illustration beyond the colors. So hens are in these cages. 95% um, of egg-laying hens in the US and Canada are kept in tiny cages. Um, you can see some of them here. They're usually most, most hens, most cages here had four to five hens in the cage. Um, and a cage is about the size of, it's about that big, it's about the size of a microwave. Um, each hen on average had less space than this sheet of paper. So it's, walking into that place was very uh, startling. It's, and the way it was arranged is also very much like a warehouse. Um, so there's one level of hens here, there's a second level here, third level here, fourth level way over the head. Um, to get there, you actually have to climb on the lower levels to even be able to see inside. It's really stacked up to the ceiling with animals that are never stepping outside, that never have sunlight or fresh air, that are really not able to move. So who here thinks that's a problem? Okay, <laughs> everyone, good. I think that's a huge problem. There's um, hundreds of millions of hens. There's about <coughs> one hen per person in the US, egg-laying hen. And the fact that they're kept in cages is really problematic. I mean, if you think about the word animal, it shares a root with the word animate, because it's the ability to move and the desire to move that sets an animal apart from a plant. Um, but in today's industrial animal agriculture, animals often cannot move or they're very restricted in even the ability to move. Um, so while I was staying with Brick, I went to other farms as well. I became a part of the community and I, I really liked the community. Like I loved the culture um, of the farmers. I thought it was um, very warm and really tight knit. I went to a pig farm, a chicken farm, a turkey farm as well. And at that stage, I, had, I knew, I had started to know what was going on. And it really bothered me. So I was at a crossroads where I had to decide, what do I do now? Do I just go back to Wall Street or to something else that's similar um, and forget about everything? Or do I explore further and see if I can find solutions? And I decided that I should look for solutions. So my journey took me around the world. I started off in Canada. I went to the US, Vermont, and California in the US, um, Mexico, Belize, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and the United Arab Emirates too. It's a really big cross-section of different kinds of countries. So this was sort of my process. I wanted to have investigations to really look deeply at everything. And I wanted to see what the exact issues are, not just the surface issues, but more the more entrenched problems. Um, and then I wanted to create solutions that could really change <coughs> things. So we've already talked about the animal welfare aspect of it, which to me was the most um, motivating aspect. Um, but there's also really significant things to say about the health aspect of 
factory farms or the lack of help and the environmental damage as well. So if we think about what the problem is, the definition of the factory farm itself hints at it. Um, this is online, I think, Miriam Webster. So it's a large, or confinement agriculture is another word for it, because they're confined. Um, it's a large industrialized farm, especially a farm on which large numbers of livestock are raised indoors in conditions intended to maximize production at minimal cost. So all of that is what I found, and then I added in to the producer. Because when we're saying minimal cost, that's actually not the case. Factory farms have very substantial costs. They're just externalized. So it's minimal cost to the producer, but it's not minimal cost to the world by any stretch. So let's talk about some of the health problems. Um, so anti antibiotics, antibiotic resistance. What is that? You can feel free to answer. I know so it's it's actually antibiotics that we build up resistance to we need stronger ones to fight infection. Yes, we're fed antibiotics build up resistance and we need stronger antibiotics um, to proceed further. So why is this mentioned here? I think it's because when these animals get sick, they give it antibiotics, the antibiotics get into the meat, and we eat the meat, that affects us as well. So it's basically everyone suffering because of this. Everyone suffering because of this, because they're being given, because they're sick. Yeah. That's something that's a common misconception. In a, Get to that. Yeah, my sense is they're giving the animals the antibiotics as a sort of a preventative, whether they're sick or not. Yes. They're living on them. Yes. As natural as if they were drinking water or eating. Food. Yes. So animals are fed antibiotics more these days as a day-to-day -day measure. So they're being, it's always in their food. Whenever they eat any corn, it's mixed into the corn antibiotics. And 80% of antibiotics in the United States are not consumed by humans. They're consumed by farm animals. That's a huge problem because a lot of the diseases that affect animals are the same that affect us. And the overuse in farms leads to antibiotic resistance, which has been documented internationally, US, Australia, and other places. And that antibiotic resistance means that it's tougher for us to get better, and it's going to get tougher and tougher. Um, the World Health Organization has said that if we keep using antibiotics in the same way we're using them today, there could be a time when a simple cut on the arm can kill you, because you get a bacterial disease from that that you cannot cure, even though it's a very common sort of thing. Um, so the use of antibiotics is very pervasive. In, the reason farms use it isn't to make animals better, it's because for whatever reason they grow faster. When they're eating antibiotics, they grow faster, and that means um, it's more profit. So it's really a financial mechanism. It's not used for medical reasons. Um, so flu viruses, that's another area. So the 2009 swine flu was very, very damaging. The thing about flu viruses is that it's very tough to know the exact death toll because organizations like the World Health Organization only take into account the lab confirmed deaths, which are a minority of the total deaths. Um, but it's estimated by the Centers of Disease Control that about 200,000 people died worldwide in the swine flu. Only a tiny amount of those deaths were in the US, but in poor countries in Asia and Africa, <coughs> Um, and especially among elderly people, there were a lot of deaths in those countries. So um, flu viruses are very easy to spread in factory farms. The, why is that? Yes, because of the confinement, because of the numbers of animals, thousands of animals, and because a lot of meat, or a lot of the industry today is very global, a single animal's body parts can be sent to different countries based on the demand factors in those countries. So 
it's become very easy for viruses to, sp to spread. Uh, the New York Times Magazine just wrote an article yesterday that I read about avian flu in the US. I think that in the next decade or so, we're going to see very substantial flu viruses. It's just um, the conditions animals are kept in today and the conditions of the system and the lack of sort of oversight um, within it makes it very easy for viruses to start and then to spread. Um, disease is another factor. A lot of animals are diseased. This picture is one I took in Vermont. This cow is number 3560. Her date of birth is 12-23-11. Um, and this is a Holstein cow. That's the common dairy breed. So do you see her face? Do you, what is that? Those markings. So that's ringworm. It's a kind of um, fungus or mold that grows. And in farms in the US, I went to a dozen dairies um, in California and Vermont. It's everywhere. Um, and this disease actually shows us a lot about what's going on. So ringworm thrives in darkness. It thrives, because it's a fungus, it thrives in darkness and, and certain kinds of conditions. It doesn't thrive in sunlight. Cows that are grass-fed are very unlikely to have ringworm compared to cows who are in feedlots. Um, in feedlots, there's thousands of them, and they're constantly rubbing against each other, and there's a roof. They're never, ever stepping out on grass. So it's really a breeding ground for this disease, which is also transferable to humans. I was afraid I would get it. I didn't, which is good. Um, but it's... It, Ringworm, I think more than most things, shows us how welfare relates to health. If cows are outside, they do not get ringworm. I've never seen an outdoor cow with ringworm. Now, about the environment. So this is essentially how the factory farm process is. It's not a cycle. It's a straight line. Corn, animal, manure. A pasture-based farm or an old-fashioned kind of farm um, is more of a cycle. It's um, sun grows the grass, which grows the cow, and the manure then replenishes the grass. So it's more holistic, it's more circular, whereas this is very linear. Now, corn. Corn feeds farm animals, by far it's the main thing that they eat, whether it's cow, chicken, or pig. Um, and what's, what's the problem with this? Like, what's wrong with corn or growing all of this feed to, farm, to feed to farm animals? Yes, all of those things. It's not an efficient use of resources, and it's not a balanced diet. Um, so an area twice the size of Paris is lost every day because forests are converted to farmland. Forest land twice the size of Paris is lost every day to be converted to agriculture, largely to grow corn to feed to the animals. Um, we're losing a lot of forest land that we really cannot afford to lose. Three species go extinct every hour on average. Every hour. Thousands are going extinct every year because their habitat is just disappearing. Just to get for us to create these mega farms. Um, so corn feeds the animal and then there's manure on the other end. A lot of manure. And because the farms are set up as factory farms, there's nowhere for the manure to really go. They just tend to dump it all in one place. When it rains, it often runs off and it pollutes water bodies. According to the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, manure from factory farms is the biggest pollutant of water bodies. Um, 
So it's a problem on both ends environmentally. On the one hand, we're using forests to create farms um, to create all this meat. Um, and on the other side of the process, there's this manure that's going into the water. So key insights, so there's a lot of insights I developed. I call this key insights because these are only the key ones for today. Uh, um, but the problem is not people, it's the system itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the people are often really nice and a lot of them themselves are unhappy with the direction of their industry. Um, the industry itself I found is very polarized. Um, it's, just, it's just changed so rapidly and it's continuing to change and in a direction that's not sustainable whatsoever in the long term that farmers themselves, many farmers I met are um, opposed to that. Um, another thing I noticed, especially in the Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore region was wealth and animal welfare sort of go in the opposite direction which is not what you'd expect. Um, so Indonesia is poor, Malaysia is medium, and Singapore has the same GDP per capita as the United States and Canada. In Indonesia, I noticed um, a village farming system, which is a more traditional system around the world. A hundred years ago, all farms were like that, more of a backyard operation, a few chickens, maybe a couple of pigs, a couple of cows, and they're outside there they can be animals in Indonesia I also noticed people walking cows like people would walk dogs here um, so in Malaysia though when you go it's completely different it's very industrial and um, fast food chains have played a role in that um, so I never like while I was at Dartmouth a Dartmouth friend told me I, would, I never go to fast food places, I would never eat fast food. And I didn't understand why and I asked her why is that and she couldn't really explain it to me. Um, but in Malaysia I really understood why that is. And so fast food companies, McDonald's, KFC, when they go to other countries, they create their own system and totally disintegrate the local farming system. Um, so they create their, they have their own breeds of chickens, they have their own antibiotics, their own artificial insemination processes, they'll build the exact same factory farms everywhere. The local farms are out of business. They also change um, the consumption habits in the countries. Local consumption habits tend to be healthier, but then those get taken out and it's a transition to burgers, fries, and soda. Um, so what a that's uh, complex, but essentially, as countries get wealthier, our lives improve and cats' and dogs' lives improve, but often farm animal lives tend to become worse. Um, so this is something I find interesting. If this is the world map. Uh, our plate is our most direction connect, our, di our most direct connection with the planet. We already discussed the forests and the water bodies um, and it's also our direct connection with um, animals. Okay, so solutions are important. Um, I divide solutions into two kinds. There's producers and that relates to economics and policy and there's consumers. Mm, okay, so while I was studying economics and policy here to one day maybe work at the UN, I never realized that it would actually help me in Project Animal Farm and thinking about things. The problems are essentially due to economic incentives being the only factor in play and due to a very significant lack of policy in the area. So right now, Everything is about just cutting costs. Companies just want to cut costs and make more money. If you create a lot more suffering by cutting a cent on an egg or anything else, you're going to still cut that cent. There's no policy. Under the law, a pig is equal to a table in that they're both forms of property and you can do whatever you want. You're not going to go to jail. 
Now that's not how it has to be. Uh, Europe, for instance, has made good progress. In Europe, animals are legally recognized as sentient beings, not objects, not property, but sentient beings, and farm animals and other animals. Um, in Europe, also countries are legally required to pay attention to animal welfare when they set their laws. Animal welfare is legally on an equal footing with things like gender equality and health care and education. It is very much of an agenda item. Even the cages that I showed you earlier, the hen cages, those are banned in Europe. If you cage hens like that, you go to jail. Um, but here, those practices are very mainstream and in the US and Canada, I live in Canada, uh, we're really behind on this progress. There's a huge amount of room for improvement and for change. Um, and okay, so policy is the way I view policy um, is as a circle that encompasses practices. If it falls within the circle, it's appropriate and it's a legal practice. If it falls outside, it's illegal. But there is no circle when it comes to the food industry, when it comes to farm animal treatment. <coughs> there is no structure that's guiding actions except for profit and only profit. Um, okay. Now, consumers are, that's people like us. I thought this was a funny comic. I will let you read it. So, <laughs> um, consumers are people like us. I did a TV interview in Toronto where the host asked me, um, and I thought the question came out of nowhere, but he said, so would you say eating is a political act? And I said, of course, it is a political act um, because we are exercising our values. We are taking a stand. Um, I've never liked the word consumer. Like, I never like to think of myself as a consumer because it's a very passive word. It suggests that you're just sort of sitting there and passively consuming whatever happens to be there without really thinking about it. I think we can change consumer to be active consumers. Uh, we can think about what we're eating and how we're eating. Um, I personally have been vegetarian for about 10 years uh, since I was a sophomore at Dartmouth. Um, when I, I didn't know too much, but I knew enough that I wasn't comfortable with the food industry. And so to me, it was a form of um, boycotting products that I don't agree with. I mean, when we, when we vote politically, we, we're saying I want this candidate in place because that candidate represents my values and my principles. It's the same thing when we're buying things, which is something we do a lot more often than we vote. Uh, when we're paying money to any company to buy its products, what we're saying is whatever you're doing is fine with me. Keep on doing it. I'm going to pay you to do it. And in cases where the products are really cannot be ethically justified and where they're environmentally very damaging as well, I think we really do need to think about it. Um, reducing meat, milk, and eggs is very important and also very simple. Um, in the US, the average meat consumption per capita is 170 pounds of meat per year that people are eating. That meat is bad for us, it's full of antibiotics, it's also too much. Um, we can easily reduce consumption, whether that's smaller servings or lesser meat-based meals or meatless Mondays. Um, and there are all kinds of things and ways to do it, but it's very important. I do want to clarify something. It's not an all or nothing situation. So sometimes people don't do anything because um, they think, they view it as either doing everything, being uh, fully vegan and fully 
uh, organic or fully local versus doing nothing, which is just very passive consumption. And it doesn't have to be just one or the two options. It can be somewhere in the middle. Um, people doing what they can, when they can, without necessarily doing every single thing. Mm. Okay, my favorite part. <laughs> um, questions, answers, thoughts? Yes? So you mentioned that there's a lot of land devoted to... Oh, just one second. She'll give you, Joanne will give you a microphone. feed for these animals. Mm -hmm. How does that land usage compare to the amount of land you would need for these animals to graze? A lot of land being used, how does that compare to the grazing land? Sure, that's a good question. Um, grazing land would require more land. <coughs> uh, if it were grass-based, it would require more land for sure. And so the question is, do we have enough land? We do have enough land if we reduce our meat consumption at the same time. So if the entire world starts eating 170 pounds of meat per person per year, then no matter what system we have, it's not going to be enough. But if we do start to cut back, then there's enough land for sure to have an outdoor system. Yes, Maddie, go ahead. Um, is there a reason you chose to investigate the countries you did? Sure, the reason for it, um, Canada, because I was living there, US, because it's really the hub of all of this. Um, other countries imitate the US. They, and the US companies, KFC, McDonald's, and factory farm companies are the ones that go abroad and just change everything. Um, so U.S. plays a really huge role in that. Um, there's also an assumption that countries make that whatever the U.S. is doing is right. So, I mean, the U.S. has very significant cultural exports as well, whether it's jeans or music um, or whether it's movies. But people also assume that the American diet is a good diet. Um, they assume that the American farming system is the good system, and those inherent assumptions are pretty dangerous. Um, so the U.S. was very important for me. Uh, Mexico and Belize. Belize, a lot of farming is done by Mennonite missionaries. So I was curious to see how the traditional farming works, and it was really uh, fascinating. I saw some beautiful farms there. Um, Mexico, because it was near Belize. <laughs> um, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, because I wanted to see the wealth transitions. Um, and United Arab Emirates, because I grew up there. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> and, yes? So I, I think the National Humane Society has been very active in trying to um, improve some of the standards of factory farms and in trying to bring that to the public's awareness. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Sure, um, the Humane Society's role. The Humane Society of the US is a group I was involved with um, previously and am still involved with um, the CEO endorsed Project Animal Farm, um, and he's great. I think humane societies are doing a good job. There are other organizations as well, environmental groups and food groups and other groups that are all educating. Um, and I think we can also become activists. So I watched a documentary, I think it was The Cove, which is about dolphins, and I think it got the Academy Award for Best Documentary some years ago. But one of the people who was interviewed, he says, to me, you're either an activist or you're an inactivist. The word activist and the word feminist, these have negative connotations these days. I don't know why. But you are an activist or an inactivist, and it sounds better to be an activist than an inactivist. And in our day-to-day -day lives, we can educate our families and others um, to turn consumption, food consumption, from um, a passive activity to a very active and thoughtful one. More questions? Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if 
During your travels, you came across any farming systems that you thought were particularly inspiring or forward thinking. Um, and I don't know if you could talk a little bit sure. about some of those visions for what our system could be. Sounds good. The systems that are inspiring and good, I did come up with something. Um, being an economics major, I came up with a farm matrix. Um, I, <laughs> a farm matrix is, um, there's small pastoral farms, there's big pastoral, there's small industrial and large industrial, so there's two sides, there's pastoral versus industrial, and then the other axis is the size. And I had a slide on that, but I deleted it because I thought I wouldn't have enough time to get to it. But <laughs> so I'm glad you asked. Um, so farms today, the majority of them, like factory farms are large industrial. They have thousands of animals and they're very industrial. The previous kinds of farms uh, 100 years ago and still in certain countries like Belize and Indonesia are small pastoral. They have a few animals um, and they're outdoors. Now, another kind of system that would be really great is large pastoral. A lot of economies of scale, a lot of cost savings come from economies of scale. But to have economies of scale, we don't need it to be a factory farm. It can be a large farm of, let's say, several hundred animals, even a thousand animals, while also being an outdoor farm. I came across two of those, one of them in Vermont, um, which was really good on the mountains. There's hundreds of cows, there's also pigs, and I think they had goats as well. And they're just grazing, they're having grass, and it's a very large farm. In Canada, too, I came across one of um, pigs, sheep, and cows where they're also outside 1,000 acres, really big and good, while also having cost savings and so people are buying. I think um, large pastoral is something that can work. Um, it can work anywhere and everywhere, and it's a very new idea at this stage. Even these farmers who I met were considered more sort of radicals or innovators. Um, but I think going into the future, I don't think we can return to a time of small farms. I think that time is gone right now. Um, but we can transition from large industrial to large pastoral, which would be a very productive transition. Thanks. Go ahead, Madison. Um, that being said, I was wondering what role you think big businesses like Cargill or Unilever could possibly play in this? Because I know there's a debate that, maybe not a debate, but an idea that mm -hmm. they could help with sustainable change by um, en encouraging or having policies of their own that promote sustainability in their production. Sure, what role can big companies play? Um, and that's, you said it, they can play a substantial role. Um, so sometimes when companies do these things, it's more uh, public relations, it's PR, and they're not really sincere about it, including mislabeling. Other times they are sincere about it. I think um, big business can play a substantial role. I don't know that it's playing that role at this stage, at least not in the United States and Canada. But if it were to play a role, then that would be um, very good. I think there, I mean, we see that companies like uh, several companies, grocery chains, restaurant chains are, for instance, saying they're not going to use cage eggs anymore. They're going to use free range eggs. And that's a good step. And it's a very simple step, actually. But more companies can and should take those steps and sort of set a stance or say this is our stance and go with that. Um, even things like cafeteria, I mean, I remember Dartmouth um, started sourcing free range or cage free eggs, organic eggs while I was here. And that was a good, that was a good move. Um, more questions? Yeah, I have one. Sure. Um, oh, just a second. Yeah. Thank you, Joanne. I'm just wondering, um, like the organic, you know, label. Has right. that like 
diminished or is that a good thing? You know, is the mm -hmm. meat uh, that we're getting that if we say it's organic, number one, does it have humane restrictions according to that organic label? And, you know. That's sure, the organic label and what it means. Um, I think, the yes, for sure. I think organic is great in terms of not using antibiotics. It's good in terms of not using um, hormones. Um, dairy cows in the US, one out of six dairy cows is injected with bovine growth hormone regularly, which is, we're still studying the effects, but it's definitely not good that they're injected with hormones. Um, so organic restricts that. About the humane treatment of animals, there's a long way to go. Um, for instance, the rules say that the animal has to be outdoors 120 days of the year, which is one out of three days. But I don't see why it's not outdoors two thirds of the year or longer than that. Um, and it does vary by country. In Europe, it's a lot stronger than it is in the US and Canada. It definitely is a good concept, but it does need to become more meaningful and also more uniform. A lot of big companies find loopholes um, to get within a hair's breadth of the law. And even the organic regulations that are set by the government, they're heavily influenced by the large companies themselves. Um, so we do have a way to go. It's a good step, but we, we're definitely not at the finishing line. Customers, consumers are uh, sort of wary of organic right now, are becoming a bit wary of it. Um, the organic dairy farm I went to, for instance, they became organic not because they believe in the organic principles at all, but just because it makes more money, you can sell it for a higher price. And such farms, what they often do is they convert very minimally. They keep everything that they can as much as possible the same and making the mod minimum modifications to be qualified as organic. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot to be said about organic, including the inspection systems, which are not very good. Um, I think it has a good way to go. If you're wondering about what to buy, um, I have a guide to labels in Project Animal Farm, which goes in more depth, but I can talk uh, about it as well. Um, so websites are often very misleading. I've been on websites of factory farms. They, they have beautiful pictures, but they're fake. Literally. And they'll say our cows are outside 365 days of the year when they're not outside a single day of the year. So it's really severe and substantial mislabeling and misrepresentation. Um, and I've seen that repeatedly. So I don't trust websites. I think you can ask questions, call or email. Um, also, if you go to a place like a health food store or um, like a Whole Foods or other kind of place, they do some pre-selection for you, which is helpful. Um, but unfortunately, the burden is on us as consumers to do our research because other people are not making it easier for us. Go ahead. Given your early career trajectory, would you recommend freshman trip to incoming international students? Would I recommend the freshman trip? Yes, yes I would. <laughs> um, I think it's a good bonding experience. I'm still in touch with my um, friends from the trip. Even though I was a very difficult trippy. <laughs> I remember one time I um, woke everyone up in the middle of the night I said, there's a bear here, there's a bear. And give me your flashlight. And this guy wakes up and he gives me his flashlight and I flash it on everyone. There's no bear, it's just my imagination or something. <laughs> um, so, but it was a growing experience for me. Um, for instance, now I love the outdoors. Um, and I, would, <laughs> um, I wouldn't have sort of gotten an introduction to the outdoors if not for the trip. Um, and we have Canada Day, which is like July 4th, but it's July 1st. And I have a trip planned already, three-day weekend and a huge national park. Um, so it's, I would recommend it as a short answer to a good question. 
Yes, a couple of things. I'm wondering, as a result of your research, um, maybe it's in your book, um, what you see as the way forward to change this. And also, I wondered about ag gag laws. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, ag gag laws are very important in all of this. Um, ag gag laws are laws that states have passed to ban people like myself from going onto farms, which is crazy. Because they're in agricultural states, I have a list in Project Animal Farm, I think Idaho, Iowa, and some several other states. If you go in with a camera or a notebook, or you later write anything or show photos that are exhibited in a public way, you can actually go to jail for it. So the laws are protecting these companies at the expense of people who are trying to learn the truth and get the truth out. Um, what this means is consumers are being kept in the dark, or the goal of companies is to keep consumers in the dark, to keep them buying the products without asking any questions. ag, -AG laws are very concerning. It's sort of crazy that states have been able to pass them. It, speaks to the power of corporate lobbies in the US, which are very, very powerful. Um, that's, uh, I hope that they get removed um, over time and that more states don't follow in those paths. I, I mean, one of the reasons I went to California and Vermont, I had to see which states are not on the list, and these two are not on the list of ag, -AG laws, so I went there. But I shouldn't have to make decisions on the basis of these types of laws that are really corrupt. Um, the sustainable path to change, I think, is education. I think once we come to know what's going on, we can definitely um, act accordingly. I think producers can also play a role. Um, governments really do have to get involved and exercise oversight and regulation, which is very missing right now. So there are multiple steps, and they're all important. I don't know if I'd say one thing is more important than anything else, um, but it, the, whole, the whole of it needs to sort of be evaluated. Um, more thoughts and questions? Joanne, how are we doing for time? Are we okay? Okay. One, more One last question. That's you. you okay. <laughs> Uh, the pharmaceutical companies are so big, and the healthcare system is so big, the amount of employees, the money in it, it wouldn't be advantageous for them to us really to start being healthy and not needing them. So I almost wonder if there's some kind of secret handshake that they have with the way food is produced right now and sold to the consumer, as you say, almost in a blind manner. Don't ask questions, mm -hmm. just eat. Isn't it delicious? Um, mm -hmm. So I do wonder about that, and what would happen to something like the United States economy if those systems started falling, like the, you know, right now the corn out in the Midwest is at its lowest, so they're getting mm -hmm. all this government farm aid, mm -hmm. um, the most I think they've ever gotten. And so I'm wondering if these systems started falling apart, such mm -hmm. as pharmaceuticals, healthcare systems, factory farming, all the stuff that we really don't need if we were well. Right, uh, and I'm just wondering how would that affect the the economy? I guess I would say the okay. U.S. economy. And my, and if I can sure. ask, ask one more question, what local, regional, or national candidate has ever addressed what you've told us? Okay. So when you talk about voting for, you know, right. what we'd like to have, sure, I'd like to see the candidate. <laughs> sure. You know. Okay. I think we have one in Lebanon, Steve Wood from Poverty Lane, I think is, Poverty Orchards is on the uh, Council sure. of Lebanon. I think that's about the, the extent of what I've ever seen. Okay, um, so two good questions, thank you. You can give it right to her. Um, so let me address the first part of that, which is about the economy and if these um, economic systems, whether factory farms or the pharmaceutical companies, <coughs> corn, all of this, if we sort of change this, how does that look? I think it new um, sort of new enterprises replace the old ones, 
And keep in mind that these enterprises themselves are relatively new. Like the, this is what we have right now is a very unique experiment in farming and eating. This is eating this much meat, it's never been done before. Um, people have not existed before us, before our generation, before people in the last couple of decades to have eaten this much meat. Um, so this isn't, this isn't sort of entrenched as such, although it seems that way. Um, another thing is that these, for instance, uh, subsidies, they tend to benefit the big farms at the expense of small farms. So if those subsidies are removed, it actually helps hugely because then the better farms are getting recognized, the prices are not uh, sort of skewed. Um, even things like, I mean, a veggie burger should never cost nearly as much as a beef burger. I mean, a beef burger, if you take into account all the costs of um, the environment and if you take into account even the workers' treatment and their poor health because of their jobs, if you take into account uh, food safety outbreaks, the cost of cleaning up rivers, assuming that gets done, and you're not going to find a hamburger below 20 or $30. Like if the costs are actually fed in, which they're not at this stage. Um, so I think by changing the structure, we make it more fair to the better farmers. The price gaps are not as different. Um, or sorry, the price gaps are more fair. The second part of your question, can you remind me? Sorry, bad memory. Oh, politicians, who yes, yes, politicians. who to vote for, yes. Um, so I think it's not yet on the political agenda as much as it should be in Canada. It just has become Stephen Harper. It's very not into the environment, let's put it that way. Um, and Justin Trudeau is much more about climate change and he's giving the funding accordingly. Um, so he doesn't, or as far as I know, he doesn't directly address consumption habits because if he did, obviously, um, I mean, politicians are in a bit of a tough spot because they have to sort of keep multiple different viewpoints in mind. Um, but on a broader tone, it is an agenda item. Climate change has become an agenda item recently in Canada. Um, and in the US, I'm not that familiar with the candidates or the local candidates, but um, I think it can become more of an agenda item over time. A lot of what we've talked about, like unfortunately, there aren't quick fix solutions, although it would be really, really great if there were. Um, but change is going to take time, years or decades. Um, and it, we can play a role in speeding it up or slowing it down. Um, but no matter what, it's going to take time. Um, so I want to say, give some thank yous. I'd like to thank Joanne Needham for bringing me here and for um, doing a lot of work to get everything arranged. I'd like to th thank Sadhana Hall as well. Um, I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank Amy Stringer for putting up posters in the local area. Um, and I've really enjoyed this. I hope you have as well. Um, there are some, so yes, the Norwich Bookstore, I'd also like to thank, which has been very wonderful. Um, they're selling copies of Project Animal Farm right outside the door. Um, so do drop by, it's a great bookstore just across the river. Um, whether you get a book now or whether you drop by the bookstore. Um, I have a newsletter list, which I've forgotten to pass around. But um, sign up, I send out a monthly newsletter that'll keep you updated on everything. There are also postcards outside. If you have any questions, my email's on my postcard, info at soniafaruki.com, also there. Um, you can just email me anytime and I tend to be pretty quick. Um, so thank you everyone. Thank you.